morning, everybody. It's good to be gathered with you and to see brothers and sisters and a warm welcome to our visitors and our newcomers. Let us continue in our worship. If you would turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 13. John 13. We're going to be focusing on verses 18 through 30. speaking to the twelve disciples, he says, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Most assuredly, I say to you, who He who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. When Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Then, leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread... He gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus had said to him, Buy those things we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. Having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately, and it was night. Amen. Let's unite our hearts and pray that God will come and minister to us through the preaching of this word. Let's pray again. Our Father, we ask you this morning that you would cause us to feel our utter need and dependence upon the Spirit of God. Father, we believe in the Holy Spirit. We pray according to your grace that you would cause him to come amongst us now, that he would, as the Sovereign Spirit, blow upon the hearts of your people and upon the hearts of the unconverted. Father, we pray that we would all with eager hearts look to you now in this moment, that you would speak to us savingly in your word, that your word would be applied with power by the Spirit of God to our hearts, that it would transform us. Father, we pray that you would cause every heart in this room to be warmed by the truth of your word by the grace of Jesus Christ, and that every heart would flee the wrath to come, that every heart would stand in fear of abandoning the light of the world. We pray, Father, help us to deal honestly with you in our hearts. We thank you for your word that searches us. We pray that it would search us this morning and that you would grow your people in Christ for your glory, and that you would make this day new trophies of your grace out of those who are still unbelieving. 
Glorify your name, Father, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we'll first consider the passage with our exposition, and then secondly, we will turn to our doctrine and our application. But I especially encourage you at the beginning portion, if you have a Bible, if you have it open to John 13, as we consider what the text is teaching us, and then secondly, we'll turn to what we learn and how it applies. And so let's begin here in verse 18. What is happening in these 13 verses is that Jesus is finally revealing his betrayer, but he reveals him in steps here. He has already alluded that there's something amiss in the apostolic band when he said in verse 10, not all of you are clean. And now he elaborates. He says, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen. He speaks right off the bat here of divine election. Even as the Lord is announcing his betrayer, the Lord is the one who's in control here. This is not a surprise to him. This is the planned purpose of God. He says that the Scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. That's a quote from Psalm 41 verse 9. And the Lord here reveals that the betrayer is a close friend. That's the significance of he who eats bread with me. It communicates familiarity, fondness, closeness. The one who would betray him is not an enemy and not a stranger. But a friend has lifted up his heel against the Lord. That is, has turned his back, has despised, and has had contempt for the Lord. Verse 19, he tells them this before it comes to pass in order to guard them from the undue shock or despair and to actually, he says, strengthen their faith. Lest once the betrayer is revealed, they, they think that none can be trusted and none can be authentic. He tells them now before it happens so that when it happens, they will believe that he is the one who knows the end, of, the end from the beginning and that they may be at peace with it. Verse 20 here, commentators typically agree, is a bit enigmatic in terms of its placement. What, what this uh, saying means is fairly clear, but why Jesus says it here is somewhat disagreed upon. Perhaps he's assuring the 11 who are going to remain that he does not think less of them for Judas's crime and neither will others. That seems to be the best explanation. That he's assuring them that just because Judas will prove to be a fake, Christ will raise up those who will receive the other apostles and their message with sincerity. But then in verse 21, he takes the next step and he gets more explicit. When Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Many times throughout the Gospels, Jesus has described his own sufferings and death without this anguish of heart. But here, as he thinks and speaks about the treachery of Judas, as Matthew Henry says, it touched him in a tender part. Just as the parents who raised a child are uniquely cut to the heart by his rebellion, so here Christ bemoans Judas' sin. It's a treacherous sin. It's a sin against friendship and against love. Never has Christ done Judas any wrong. Wherever Jesus was, there Judas was with him. At his table, cared for by him. And it troubles the Lord's heart. Verse 22. Then the disciples looked at one another and they all pointed to Judas and said, it's you. It's not what they say. 
They were perplexed about whom he spoke. This is shocking news to the eleven. They thought this is the band. All of us, we're in this together. We've been preaching together, healing together. They never thought one of them was capable of concealing the fact that he was in fact a devil. And in the synoptics, they all rightly start asking the question, is it I, Lord? And that's, that's right. They distrust their own hearts before they would think ill of their brother. I don't think that the eleven here are to be criticized for being naive. I think they're to be commended for their trust. And rather, Judas is to be condemned all the more for this treacherous betrayal. Verse 23, now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of His disciples whom Jesus loved. This is the Apostle John, the author of this Gospel. Jesus had a unique affection for John. Peter was the forward one, but John was the one who occupied the closest proximity to the Lord. And so verse 24, Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. This is a nonverbal motioning, which is rare for Peter. But even Peter realizes the seriousness and the need for discretion in this moment. Verse 25, then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he, John, said to him, Lord, who is it? Now, I don't think that this is a public discussion. I don't think that John said this loud enough so that everyone at the table can hear. I think John whispers to Jesus, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answers John alone. Verse 26, it is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. He doesn't name Judas. He doesn't publicly shame him. Rather, the Lord's last act towards Judas is to show him a friendly gesture. And that's not incidental. Judas must face the fact that he is betraying the one who has only done good to him. He gives him the bread dipped in the juice, which was a gesture of affection that perhaps this might cause Judas to turn from his intent. And it's ironically contrasted with how Judas will use a gesture of affection, a kiss, to give the Lord over to His enemies. And having dipped the bread, He gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now, all of them saw this, but only John knows at this point what it means. Verse 27, Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Judas has always been a devil all along. But here, at the receiving of the morsel, Satan takes more full possession of Judas. Instead of Judas breaking down at the sight of the morsel and saying, I can't do it. I can't go through with this. He takes the morsel, the final sin against mercy that hardens him, and the devil assumes control of his heart. His heart now driven by Satan, is set now upon destroying the Lord. His love of money is inflamed. His anger and his pride are let loose as he determines to carry out what was in his heart. It's also possible, I think, that Judas could have picked up that the giving of the bread was Jesus' way of identifying him, and Judas therefore knew that he was about to be found out, which caused him to act decisively. But Jesus says to him, what you do, do quickly. He seems to be challenging Judas to do his worst. 
He seems to be telling Judas, I do not fear you. And I do not fear your master. Put your plot into motion, for I am ready to suffer. Verse 28, but no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. This is an example of love believing all things. Some, because Judas had the money box, thought that Jesus was telling him, buy those things we need for the feast. Or that he should give something to the poor. The others are still unsuspecting. Supposing he's been sent out to do good. And they couldn't imagine that he's being dismissed from the band completely to betray their Lord. Verse 30, having received the piece of bread, he went out immediately and it was night. He lifts up his heel one final time against Christ and his church, never to rejoin them, and he departs into the night of a Christless eternity. Let's turn to our doctrine and our application. That's the exposition. Let's now consider what we learn. I've got three things that I want to draw out this morning. And I'll give them to us as we go. Three things by way of instruction and application. Number one, what we learn from this passage is that God is bringing about through the treacherous sin of Judas, the salvation of the world. God is here bringing about the salvation of the world through the treacherous sin of Judas. It's very important that we understand this account from not just the human perspective, but the divine perspective. This is not evil triumphing. From a creaturely perspective, this is Satan doing his worst through Judas, trying to destroy the Son of God. But from the divine perspective, it is God destroying the works of the devil. Jesus says right at the beginning, the Scripture will be fulfilled. Judas and Satan are agents here. But there's a more ultimate agent at work, namely God who accomplishes all His good pleasure. Isaiah 53.10 It pleased the Lord to bruise Him. He has put Him to grief. Romans 8.32 He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up. That's talking about the Father. And it's the same exact Greek word, give him up, that's used here in John 13 of the betrayal. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Acts 2.27, the early church prays, for truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Christian, God's sovereignty is not just a doctrine to be argued about. God's sovereignty is literally what undergirds the love of God in the Gospel. Because without it, if you remove God from the equation of what's happening here, if you don't have the Father purposing the betrayal, purposing the mocking, and the crucifixion to, to deliver His people from death and hell, we don't have a Gospel. If the Father is just hands off in all of this, all you have, all that the Father can say is look at this wonderful accident that has happened. 
I can't believe it worked out. I guess sinful men can do something good. No, the refrain of the Scriptures is they meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. I mean, isn't that all of our hope? If we can't say that, and we don't believe that, do we really understand the Gospel at all? If you remove God's hand and His predestining plan from the equation, we don't have any Gospel. There's a reason Paul calls it the Gospel of God. Where God the Father directs the gaze of His sinful children towards the cross of Christ, and the Father says to us, look at how I crushed My Son for you. He says to us, you see those wounds? That's My doing for you. You see that death, that's my doing for you. The heart of the gospel is that behind and underneath the human sin and the betrayal and the wicked intentions of men, it is ultimately God the Father giving up the Son of His love to save us. He intends even apostasy and betrayal to work as messengers of His love to His children. And how that infuriates the devil. Every single time the devil tries to harm Christ or His church, God the Father turns His schemes on their head and makes them actually serve His loving purposes to His church. Every single time. The devil tries to bruise the son's heel, and in trying to do so, the son crushes the head of the serpent. The devil is mocked by God again and again. Psalm 2, God sits in the heavens and laughs and holds him in derision. And Christian, we get to join in that victory and say to the enemy of our souls, Satan, you are greater than me, but you are nothing compared to my God who is for me. And my God, Romans 16, will crush Satan underneath my feet, just as he always has. This is not evil triumphing. This is divine wisdom and power and love triumphing. That brings us to the second thing. Secondly, God is making the captain of our salvation perfect through suffering. He's making the captain of our salvation perfect through suffering. Matthew 26, 24. Why must the Son of Man be betrayed as it is written of Him? He must be betrayed because He must be the man of sorrows despised and rejected of men. Christian, you you may already understand this. Some of us may not. This is very important. The sorrows and the afflictions that the Lord Jesus Christ went through were not just accidental to His ministry. They were that which qualify Him to be our sympathetic High Priest. Hebrews 2.10 For it was fitting that He should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Matthew 8.17 He Himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Christian, it is necessary that Christ suffer to the uttermost in order that He might be able to show grace to the uttermost. Christian, have you known the grief of watching those who have walked away from the giver of life? Watching those who professed the Christian religion 
joined the church, ate your bread, and then going out into the night of unbelief. That never gets easier, no matter how many times you see it happen. Every time it happens, it's like you get spiritual vertigo and just, you don't know which way is up or down. You, you never, you just, everything in you thinks, not them. And you would have thought, I would have fallen away before they did. And your heart sinks. Remember, Christian, if they have left us, they left Him first. Christ felt in His humanity the full dagger of human betrayal for us. And because He has, there is in Jesus Christ a treasury of grace for wounded and disillusioned hearts. I've been there, watched or heard someone just get up and walk away from the fountain of living water for the broken cisterns of the world, selling their soul for 30 pieces of silver. And if it's not money, it's sexual gratification pleasure, fame, wanting to be liked, wanting to keep their relationships intact. And they walk away from Christ because it's not worth it to them. That's painful. But Jesus Christ in heaven right now can sympathize with your troubled heart and give grace to your troubled heart. He gave grace to Paul who had Demas, who abandoned him, falling in love with this present world. Paul says at the end of his life, no one stood with me, but the Lord stood with me. Christian, the Lord always remains even when apostates depart. He stays. He remains faithful. False sons in the church do not negate the faithfulness of the Lord. And the Lord stays not only the eleven here, but He stays our hearts, our trembling hearts. When He says in this passage, I tell you before it comes, so that when it comes to pass, you may believe that I am He. Isn't it a comfort that the Lord knows who's our hit, who are His? He knows whom He has chosen. And when those not chosen fall away from whatever profession of faith they made, isn't it a comfort to know it doesn't shake and toss the captain of the church? He knew. He knows. And we His people derive a certain peace from that. Not that it erases the heartache and the tears, but it imparts a stability that He is the same yesterday and today and forevermore. And just because some will prove to be false does not mean that there are no true, genuine followers of Christ. I think it's important that He, he guards the eleven and us here from cynicism. He keeps us from looking on all with suspicion. He tells them, there is a betrayer, but there is only one. And therefore, Christian, we can say with the author to the Hebrews, we have hope of better things concerning you. We are not of those who draw back to perdition, but who believe to the saving of the soul. Last and third thing. We're taught in this passage that Christ searches and knows the hearts of men. Christ searches and knows the hearts of men. All men. All women. All children. This passage is a warning to those who would play the hypocrite. John 2 24, you remember that passage. It says that some believed on him, but it says 
Jesus did not commit Himself to them because He knew all men and had no need of anyone to testify of man, for He knew what was in man. My friend, if that's you this morning playing the hypocrite, I pray that God would grant His Word to cut through the games that we play in our minds and our hearts. Hypocrisy does not work with God. Hebrews 4.13 There is no creature hidden from His sight, but all things are naked and open to Him to whom we must give an account. But how deceptive hypocrisy can be. And the web it spins and the deeper it goes, the harder it is to come out of it. If only we could deal with our hearts honestly now. Judas could have been a member in good standing in our church. He would have been. There would have been no reason to keep him outside of membership. He looked the part. He was a thief in secret, but he was good at it. No one knew. He not only looked the part, he played the part. He performed miracles right alongside the others. People were presumably converted under his ministry. He was at all the inside circle meetings when it was just Jesus and the twelve. He had all the external outward appearances of being a true saint, and yet he was a devil. And while not a human soul knew it, the Lord knew it from the beginning. John 6, 64, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray Him. Don't think that that's any less true today than it was then. No one escapes the gaze of Christ the Lord. Let me give you several things that won't save you. I'm going to give them to you quickly. Number one, being among the church does not save you. Judas was among the church. Number two, drinking in the blessings of God's Word does not save you. Judas had the same privileges as well as all of Israel. Three, having a relatively blameless life before others does not save you. Judas had that until it became known. Fourth, doing Christian things does not save you. Judas did them too. Fifth, God permitting you to go on in your secret sin without exposing you is not evidence of His favor because He did the same thing to Judas for a season. Sixth, finally, even receiving good things from Christ is not proof that you have His saving favor, for Judas received them again and again. I will tell you the one thing that will save you, apart from which all of those other things are useless. The only thing that will save your soul is a saving union with Christ by faith, which shows itself in a life submitted to Jesus Christ in His Word. And those two things are not to be separated. The life that flows from faith is distinguishable from faith, but there is no such thing as a saving faith that does not result in submission to Christ as King. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't exist. No matter how many pulpits preach otherwise. Here's why I say that. The hypocrite plays games with himself as he reads the Word of Christ. 
And he convinces himself as he reads, I'm the exception. Do you ever find yourself doing that to escape the plain meaning of Scripture? Trying to take off the rough edges. The hypocrite tells him things like, this verse is generally true for others, but I'm a unique case and the Lord will understand. Or they'll tell themselves when they come across a hard text, other Christians take this too seriously or too legalistically. They don't understand it, but I do. And hypocrites purposely separate themselves from Christians who would hold them accountable to the plain meaning of the text. My friend, if that's you this morning, and I don't know who you are, if that's you this morning, you do not want to gamble your never dying soul on exceptions that the Bible never speaks of. You might be here and you're secretly enslaved to sin, but you tell yourself, but David sinned and he was saved. But David repented. And how the devil loves to hide that part from the hypocrite in order to soothe him in his sins. To all of us, God has told us what He requires of us and it's in this book. And we cannot change it. We cannot alter it. We either accept it or we reject it. God cannot lie. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but My words will never pass away. He means it. He literally means it when He says, why do you call Me Lord but not do what I say? He means it when He says, there will be many on the last day who cry out, Lord, did we not do this in Your name and this in Your name? And the Lord will say, Depart from Me, you workers of iniquity. Jesus literally means it when He says, He who will not take up His cross and follow Me cannot be My disciple. All of those things He means. He's spoken clearly. And my friend, I wish I had the ability to look into your heart and make you look into your heart and to tell you, you are the man this passage is speaking about. You are the one who's going the path of Judas. I can go off externals and I can go off what you tell me, but if you do not deal honestly with God and with us, you do so to your own peril. Thankfully, the God of heaven can say to your heart, you are the man. Are you resisting Him even now? Are you nervous and just wishing this needs to be over? Are you just even now coming up with new excuses about why even what I'm saying isn't to be taken literally? Just new exceptions, running from the light, running from the light. God says to you this morning, stop running from the light and step into the light. Because there's a gracious Savior He's given who will even receive hypocrites and betrayers like the other eleven who all also fell away that night from their Lord, and yet when He rises from the dead, He says, I'm going to meet you in Galilee like I told you. And I'm ascending to My God and your God. The time to be truthful is now. We do not know what a day may bring forth. Christ will receive hypocritical sinners and cleanse you. 
Christian, let me just say this last brief word before we close. Christian, stay the course. We have need of perseverance. Deal with sin at its first beginnings. There have been too many falls of prominent Christian leaders in the recent past. Only God and perhaps their churches know the state of their heart and their repentance. Our response is to not become jaded or cynical or gloat over their falls, but to take heed to ourselves and realize, but for the grace of God, there go I. Hebrews 3.12, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. I think it was Spurgeon, wasn't able to find it, but I think it was Spurgeon who said, whatever verse in the Bible you wish were not in the Bible, that is exactly the verse you need to heed. And I want to say to all of you, brothers and sisters, whatever convictions the Spirit of God has brought you under, whatever proddings of the Spirit of God are upon you, and whatever pangs of conscience you have, those are the things we must bring to the light and give our diligent attention to by the grace of God. Let's pray together. Our Father, we now turn to You in prayer, praying the exhortation the author to the Hebrews gave that we would take care that there be none among us in which dwells an evil, unbelieving heart leading us to fall away from the living God. Father, cause every soul in this room from the oldest to the youngest to come into the light of Jesus Christ. Father, You are the God who searches us but in Your grace, You love us. You know all of our sins and you, you bring to us a gracious countenance in Christ. And so we pray with one heart, cause us to walk in sincerity before You and before one another. Father, we pray that we would exhort one another every day as long as it is called today. Let us love one another. Let us strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Let us press on for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus because He has laid hold of us. Draw us with Your cords of love. Bind our hearts to Yours. Keep us. Let us never outlive our love to You. Bless Your people. Strengthen Your church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.